Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Fire for Hedis and Stars, Unanswered Questions. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few brief housekeeping details. Today's webinar is being recorded, and an online archive of today's event will be available a few days after the session. I'd like to remind you of a HIPS antitrust statement and ask that you refer to it in the handout section at the bottom of your screen. The antitrust statement prohibits us from discussing competitively sensitive information. You may ask a question at any time during the presentation by typing your question into the Q&A box located on the right side of your screen and pressing Enter. If you have trouble seeing the slides at any time during the presentation, please press F5 to refresh your screen if you are on a PC and Command R to refresh your screen if you are using a Mac. We are very fortunate to have with us today Mr. Jeff Springer and Mr. Swanand Prabhutendokar. Jeff is a Senior Vice President of Performance Management at uh, Sidious Tech, driving the Product Management Business uh, Analyst and Product Strategy for all products and solutions. He has more than 20 years of healthcare industry experience, having worked with leading healthcare technology vendors. Jeff holds a mechanical engineering degree and an MBA from the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School, where he graduated as a Palmer Scholar. Bonan is Senior Vice President of Data Management at Sidious Tech, where he leads the Healthcare Interoperability, BIDW, Big Data Practices. With more than 18 years of experience in information technology, Swanon has worked across regulatory reporting requirements such as MU and healthcare standards and frameworks, including HL7. He holds a master's degree in information technology from IIT Mumbai. At this time, I would like to turn the floor over to the speakers. Welcome. Thank you, Lisa. And we'll get started um, by uh, trying to understand where our audience is around uh, FIRE, doing a quick poll question. So our first poll um, is uh, just to get a sense of where you are. So how would you classify your organization's commitment to FIRE? So what is FIRE? a couple of POCs, you're experimenting with it, dipping your toe in, you're using FIRE APIs for internal uh, exchange or you're using FIRE for external exchange. So as we, uh, as we let you answer uh, this poll, we'll, we'll get started with what some of the questions that we want to answer today are. So four key questions. One, what's the benefit of implementing FIRE, both from a HEDIS perspective as well as from a strategic perspective? So why is there this new thing of FIRE and what benefit does it have? What are the current initiatives around FIRE, both from a strategic and a regulatory perspective? So what's going on out there? What are other people doing? What are regulatory bodies doing? What do I need to do to, uh, to start with FIRE? What's the, base, the bare minimum uh, that needs to be done to be compliant? from a regulatory perspective, whether it's CMS, NCQA, or even working with a provider? And then what should my strategy be on implementing FIRE? So we'll go through some of these questions and uh, give you a perspective for your organization. So as we do this, we'll take a look uh, at our poll here and see what kind of uh, audience we're dealing with. And so I've published the poll results, and as we can see, 31% um, probably don't even know uh, the spelling of fire, uh, so we'll teach you how to do that as well. Um, we got 26% uh, on the other side who are using it with their external providers. So those are the uh, two poles and then a mix in between. So I actually say it's probably evenly distributed. Uh, we've got some experts and some people who are, are here to learn. So as we get started here, then we'll get into our our first question. So we look at uh, why we need uh, to continually look at new data exchange formats, new initiatives around this. You can see that physicians, payers, all entities are spending a tremendous amount of money on managing quality. Uh, physician practices in a total across the U.S. spend $15 billion and about 700 uh, plus hours a year dealing with uh, quality reporting. So this is a tremendous expense, both time and money. And so how do we help to improve this? How do we help uh, to drive this down is really the question we're, we're looking at here. As we start to answer this question, we have to think, why are we uh, trying FIRE now? 
and as we look back through history, there's been a number of different things that we've used to try to exchange data. And we have to look at, one, what they were and why they didn't or why we're trying something new. So what are the things that we've tried before? What about them was successful? What about them uh, we uh, potentially missed the mark on? So as we now look to fire, does this close the gaps that we had before? So looking back over time, we started with uh, electronic data exchange, maybe custom formats, uh, maybe CSVs, other types of things. And there certainly was value here. So uh, starting to ingest uh, that supplemental data, you were able to transmit it electronically. Um, but the challenges here were many. So one, these formats weren't standardized. Um, some of them weren't even structured and you couldn't do them in real time. So it was both expensive and timely or costly uh, from the perspective of how do I get this data from my providers? How do providers provide this data? Um, there's no support standardization around it, so you have to rebuild uh, this every time you go out there. So it was a good first step, but it was expensive and only really done by a very, very select few. As we move to some of uh, standards, and I say quote unquote because HL7, CCDA, even though they are regulatory standards, still get used quite liberally um, and differently by different folks. It did give us a standard uh, to build as an interface, and this was actually very helpful for starting to consume different types of data um, and uh, to know what to expect. However, there were definitely restrictions here. So these are, are standards that are complex in nature. They were driven by regulatory bodies. You know, CCDA has 57 different segments and lots and lots and lots of recursive calls. HL7, what HL7 are you using? ADT, ORU, uh, so on and so forth. There's many different HL7 standards. And if you look at HL7, you can't get all the data that you need from it. CCD, you might be able to get that data, but then it wasn't uh, understood or used in a similar way. Uh, in addition, you can't get this data real time and you can't get other types of mechanisms out of this. And so definitely a step in the right direction. Um, but as we look at and think about how do we do this, how do we leverage this, uh, it's still not quite standardized and definitely not real time and still expensive for providers. So providers enabling this, uh, providers using this. Um, we've also seen from uh, different EMR vendors not enabling this in the same way. So some EMR vendors uh, enable uh, this very proactively and then some are resistant to it. Now with FHIR, what we're seeing is uh, some of these things coming together. So one, uh, a better structured representation of this. So no more loosely uh, coupled standards. So everybody can use it in the same way. This is both industry-led as well as regulatory-led. So why does the industry-led make a difference is from an adoption perspective, people are looking to adopt, people are working together, both payer and provider vendors uh, are, are looking at this in terms of how do we exchange data so there's not that same resistance. But the regulatory bodies coming in as well to force this is tremendously helpful so that um, we can drive the adoption of that uh, as a standard. Um, the challenges here is it still is sharing data and some of the vendors want to keep that data uh, in their own systems. They want to uh, control that. Um, they're still going to have challenges with different versions that are out there, um, but it is an API based. It is real time um, and it is standardized, which means that even for your smallest providers that have this enabled through their EMRs, uh, they should be able to enable that over time. So going from something that was unstandardized, difficult to use, uh, not real time, we're moving towards something that the industry agrees on and we can uh, actively share over time. So that should be a tremendous improvement for how do we leverage this, how do we use this. Now, how do we, uh, how does FHIR change the picture of data exchange? So first of all, it's a modern standard, it's XML based, we can use it with APIs and all of the different vendors are understanding and using the same mechanisms for doing this. Once those standards are out there, it's very low cost. And so if we think about the very first statistic that we showed in terms of the cost for providers, this should greatly reduce their costs as well as payers' costs. So payers are going out and chasing providers for this data. That's 
incredibly expensive resources. So setting this up, leveraging it, using it should be much lower cost for everybody involved and a better solution. So this is also truly interoperable and this is what we really need to get to. Uh, this is what we really need to get to in order to make sure that we are um, really exchanging this data is that true interoperability, you turn it on and it works. The flexible payload. So what is the use case that you have in mind? As I mentioned with the HL7, there are many different standards here. We're using uh, less number of standards, but then giving you the ability to go and get the data that you need, and as well as having a universal adapter to it. So co covering a broad set of elements, um, and, and it can act as a bridge across these different things. And the goal here is to unlock these data silos. So going from a world where everything was fee-for-service to a world where we're becoming more value-based, it's gonna become incredibly important uh, to be able to share this data and this really unlocks those silos. So where are we from a regulatory strategic perspective around this uh, becomes the important question now. And so as we look at this, we're gonna to go to our next polling question here. And let me uh, start that poll as we read the question. So how would you classify your understanding and readiness to implement fire for quality programs. So clearly uh, from our last poll, we saw that um, about half of the folks were doing internal or external projects. Um, so I would expect them, uh, the people who answered that question to be towards the bottom end of these. Um, but as we read through these, so the first answer is not aware of NCQA's plans and relevance of fire for HEDIS data collection. You're somewhat aware of NCQA's digital measure plans uh, and their fire use cases. You've got a documented strategy and you're gonna be leveraging uh, fire for quality use cases, or you're already executing pilots for HEDIS and STARS uh, that are out there. Um, so we'll let uh, folks uh, start to answer that question. We'll go through one more slide here and then we'll come back to that. So as I mentioned, fire is being used by uh, the vendors and driving that. Um, but we also need the hammer of regulatory in order to enforce it because there, there have been some vendors that don't want to share data. Um, looking back, we have to look at what the history is here to see if we're moving in the right direction once again. It starts with the public sector and CMS started with blue buttons. So, hey, I want to share four years of Medicare Part A and Part B data. I'm going to do that over an API. Uh, for the 50 some million odd beneficiaries. And this is a push, this is a one way, uh, this is um, uh, um, Medicare sharing that outwards. And so that unidirectional data is good for answering a lot of different questions, but it can't be a back and forth and it's definitely not a sharing mechanism between payers and providers and definitely not a data collection. So step two, Da Vinci. So this is actually the private sector driving the initiative. So one of the issues that we've had with some of the public sector initiatives is adoption by the private sector. And how do you get the private sector to adopt as you involve them? And DaVinci was a first of a kind scale project with a payer provider collaboration to drive interoperability in a bi-directional exchange driven by the vendors themselves. And because it's driven by the vendors, you get that adoption, you get that buy-in, you get that acceptance that this is where we're moving. Now, you don't get that from everybody, so we go to the third step. The CMS interoperability and patient access rule really is bringing that regulatory hammer to that bi-directional exchange of information and making sure providers are exposing certain data, payers are exposing certain data, there's the ability to exchange that data um, and to do it in a way that's uh, standardized and structured in nature. Now, as we look to the future of NCQA and uh, looking to see what they're doing, NCQA has already announced we're gonna be using some of the HEDIS measures uh, execute on fire. And we'll get to this in a little bit, but we already had you know, a quote unquote standard data model for HEDIS measures, the QDM model, but we're going to the fire model. Um, what does this mean? We're going to fire for exchange. So as uh, the providers saw back in 2014 with meaningful use, 
they were trying to create solely structured data for executing their measures. And all of the EMR vendors had to comply with this structured data and to build it in so that there are fields within the EMRs to calculate this. NCQA adopted that data model, that QDM data model that was used by uh, providers to drive their measures, but the HEDIS measures went uh, beyond the QDM model. And so we needed to look to say, how do we make sure all of the data that we need for HEDIS can be captured? And so this is where you know the fire data model and the fire processing of those comes in to take the next step. All of the data needs to be structured for HEDIS. So NCQA developing that fire model and NCQA and CMS working together towards a set of standards around the, that data exchange and using FHIR for that data exchange means that programs which were disconnected before, so on the provider side you have MIPS programs, meaningful use programs, ACO programs, all those could be uh, uh, payer based as well, and the STARS, the HEDIS programs on the payer side, we're starting to speak the same language in terms of data exchange with FHIR now, uh, with data models, even with how we're structuring those rules. Um, so we're seeing the private sector come together. We're seeing the public sector come together. We're all starting to speak with the same voice together. And that's very helpful for then creating these standards, lowering the cost, and driving uh, that through our regulatory programs. All right. So, and I started to talk about this a little bit where HEDIS was going. So on the left, we have current HEDIS. And what does this mean? We were using standards to drive HEDIS structure like HQMF, CQL, the QDM data model. What are those things? And then how do, and why do we go to FHIR-based standards around this? So the data models, the QDM data model and the CQL and the HQMF were standards in terms of machine-readable rules for uh, for HEDIS uh, measures. This was meant to reduce the administrative burden um, and standardize these things for providers. As I talked about, from the data model perspective, going to FHIR really extends the data model to make sure all of the HEDIS data that we're capturing can now be structured. And from a data exchange perspective, we're able to exchange this data. Um, in, a different, in addition, standardizing on the machine-readable formats of these. So uh, with using uh, CQL uh, and uh, fire measured reports, we're really creating a common platform payer and provider to be able to talk about not just data, but the rules themselves through these same standards and through the exchange of it through fire. And the mapping of these FHIR standards from the data model to the exchange standards back to the EMR data is similar to what providers did going back to meaningful use, make sure I have structured fields for how do I collect this data, how do I drive this data, and now I know that I can exchange it in the same way every time, and then payers can use that to calculate their rules that are out there. So going from the problems that we had of consumption of CCDA and HL7, where each provider did it slightly differently, so you'd have to tweak all of that. Creating this standardization really lowers the cost and, and can improve the adoption of these things. So let's look at timelines and where we are uh, from this perspective. And I, I think I actually didn't publish my poll, so let me go ahead and publish the poll that we did, get those results. So how would you classify your understanding and readiness to implement FHIR? Um, so 40% uh, uh, are not aware of NCQA's plans and relevance for FHIR around HEDIS data uh, collaboration. I started to talk about that. Some of you are somewhat aware, and this, these first two buckets are the biggest. So 90% of you are either not aware or somewhat aware of NQ, uh, NCQA's digital measure plans and their FHIR use cases that they're going to drive. And then 10% uh, of you have a documented strategy or executing pilots around this. So a much smaller percentage. And I actually, based on your first answers, I was expecting uh, C and D to be uh, higher in nature. So that's, that's interesting. And so this speaks to the alignment of fire programs with regulatory and what's out there. So let's talk about uh, the timeline and, and these initiatives relative to uh, not just 
uh, the standards, but what the regulatory bodies are doing and, and how that's going to be done. So 2020, so the year we're in right now, um, the most important piece here, there's there's two really important pieces. One is the, uh, the CMS is driving this interoperability rule, but providers are required to share uh, their APIs for FHIR, their US CBI, uh, FHIR API, uh, which really uh, constitutes large, large majority of the data that you would need to uh, calculate your HEDIS uh, supplemental data capture. And we'll get to that with a specific example. Um, but in our calculations, 95% of all hybrid measured data can be collected through this FHIR standard, this USDI FHIR standard. Now on the bottom here, we have what our recommendation is for you as you think about these and then leveraging these standards. So for, for those of you who don't know what standards are out there or don't know what your plans are around them, what, I, what we would do with this is we would have you select a few priority measures that you can collect using FHIR and start that as a trial set. So let's focus on those measures and we'll give you a measure as an example of things that can be collected through that. Um, and then map the elements from those US uh, CDI FHIR APIs into your HEDIS uh, standards. So start with selecting the measures, starting the mapping. In 2020, all of the APIs will not be available yet from your providers, but you should start the work uh, to start thinking about those standards, mapping those standards, and getting ready for when they will be ready. As we move to 2021, this is when that data will now be available and providers will uh, have it in their EMR. So the EMRs have to comply with these standards. They'll be rolling out those EMRs. What we recommend here is uh, down here at the bottom, partner with a few providers, pick a few strategic providers around the measures that you care about. Clearly, if you've con uh, contracted based on value-based contracts with those providers around those measures, they'll be more interested. If your members constitute a majority of those provider panels, they'll be more interested. But choose a few providers to partner with to do pilots for their EMRs. And you can pick a few different EMRs because it's going to be important based on the percentage of EMRs that you have within your systems to drive that type of conversation. Um, you're going to have to enable data exchange agreements with those providers. So this is going to take some time. You can even start those conversations now and then uh, validate that data exchange workflow with your providers um, to uh, do that data collection um, and then management and then execute uh, for updating the rules that you have out there. And we've seen from uh, some of our payer customers some really good success rates with specific providers and specific EMRs around CCDA uh, for providers that are interested. We're expecting to see similar types of uptakes uh, in terms of measure compliance uh, and closing gaps with these specific uh, hybrid, hybrid, HEDIS hybrid measures that you can select. Um, as we go forward, you can see uh, there are additional things that can be done so provider directories to access uh, for specific members. Um, you can uh, start getting patient access data uh, uh, through these and the first set of um, uh, NCQA measures will be in those fire standards come uh, the measure reporting year of 2022, so for 2021 that's out there. Um, so as you light up those pilots with those providers, um, then you can start to scale that coming into 2022 or even into 2021. So starting the FHIR data exchange, you're going to have a few FHIR measures uh, that are going to be reportable in 2022 with NCQA um, and uh, rolling out that, uh, those capabilities across that. So as you go into 2022, really uh, turning to operationalization of this, and scaling this up for your providers, making sure that it's as cheap as possible. So your large providers will have the IT staff to do this. Your smaller providers won't, and enabling really that as a flip of a switch, which should be enabled with their EMRs at that point in time, is really what you're going for. And really um, turning chart chase into the last mile uh, that's out there. So let's talk about a specific measure. So here we've selected uh, the BS, uh, BCS-E measure, and we're looking at the five fields that have to be collected uh, here for your 
um, hybrid measure data collection, um, your mammogram data service, bilateral uh, mastectomy date, unilateral right and left uh, mastectomy dates, and uh, any evidence of hospice and dates around that. And as you can see within the standard that's out there, the US CDI standard, all of these fields are standard within that. And as you look at the mappings of these, and we can provide, if you're interested, the mappings from US CDI to uh, these particular fields. In fact, we have uh, most of the measures mapped already for what's possible. They're in the procedure in the clinical notes, fire resource sections uh, of these. And really what this gets to is once you've done this mapping, and you set up the fire standards, it's just a matter of turning those on and collecting those data uh, elements from the providers at the same time the providers are enabling this from their end through their EMRs. So what used to be a heavy lift in terms of getting and calculating this standard supplemental uh, data will become much, much easier over time. Now with this, I'll turn it over to Swarand um, and he'll take us through uh, the, rest of, uh, the rest of the presentation here. So thanks, Jeff. And uh, we will look at uh, you know, what is the bare minimum that needs to be done in order to be compliant with CMS and NCK requirement. And uh, yeah, we'll also talk about you know, some of the use cases that uh, we can uh, enable uh, now that the fire-based uh, data exchange is, uh, is in place, or rather, is very, very typical current place. Uh, can we go to this? Jeff, I'll read out the poll, and uh, can you do the poll for me? So here is the next poll. Uh, would you say uh, your organization understands the potential efficiencies for quality data selection uh, enabled by FIRE? And the answers are, first one is no awareness across departments. The second one is uh, the quality team understands. Uh, the third one is quality team other, as well as the other departments understand the potential. And the fourth one is, uh, yes, the organization leadership has performed you know, business planning with respect to fire enable efficiency. So where do you think uh, your organization currently stands among all of these things? This is what we are trying to look at. Uh, I'll move forward and uh, Jeff, uh, maybe another uh, you know, 15 seconds or so, can you publish a report? Okay. Yep. Uh, so what are the opportunities uh, to drive fire efficiency uh, through, through the fire? And we thought of, uh, instead of talking for like, you can do certain things or at a, a theoretical level, what can be done, uh, we thought of talking about certain use cases. And the first use case that we were thinking is about uh, provider engagement. Uh, what we can do is, uh, you know, it could be about a gap data sharing. And what it means is we can make use, uh, a smart and fire app. The player can give a smart and fire app to provider. And that can seamlessly integrate with the underlying EHR because underlying EHR is uh, going to be a uh, fire enabled one. And what, what we are imagining is uh, provider uh, can use this app and uh, provider can search for a patient and then provider can connect the pair side. And what's going to happen is pair is going to tell provider. These are all the gaps that I see in the HIDIS calculation for that particular patient. And these are all the measures that are impacted. So uh, what happens is it's not that currently uh, providers don't uh, have any sort of screens on their EMRs or any sort of other apps which talk about gaps in care of the patient, but uh, they are mainly from the provider perspective and these are the ones which are mainly from the HIDIS perspective. So providers do understand and do, do know, the EHRs do understand uh, MIPS, MACPAS, MACRA or earlier MU and whatnot, or maybe PQR is the way it was earlier. They understand all these measures and the clinical decision support or the gaps in care calculation could be you know, majorly driven by these ones. Uh, what we're trying to tell here is uh, payer can uh, show provider the gaps from his, his angle that these are the ones which are actually hindering it. The second one could be supplemental data collection itself. Uh, uh, we all know during uh, heady season that starts sometime in January, uh, there is a lot of uh, burden on the charges. Uh, you, because uh, at the end of the 31st of December of the year, uh, you know that you are, you are done collecting your data through uh, the claims that you were to receive. 
and you will look at your charts and figure out okay which patients are other which members are uh, you know falling apart uh, so what we need to do to get my head score up and uh, there's a lot of uh, chat sheets that happens uh, phone calls will be here being made uh, we'll be like, you know talking to folks to get the cctas and all and it will be mostly i ask for data and then my provider uh, partner will supply that data to me at some point in time uh what we are imagining here is a slightly different it's a lot more proactive from our side uh pairs uh, chat is so uh, the care coordination team they would look at the chat they would look at uh, not chat but they would look at the head is output and they would look at okay for this patient uh, so this particular entity is missing and that's the reason why uh so it's not meeting meeting the performance of the given measure and then uh, they can uh, request that particular entity value from the provider uh, if the provider central and which each chart is uh, fire enabled he can actually make a request not just for the bundle but at some point in time only for that particular uh, you know, smaller piece of uh, information that that they need uh, instead of getting the whole bunch of cctas which is a long story uh, you need a huge probably need just one small procedure being done or not or maybe you are interested in one uh observation or maybe one vital uh, you can probably query just that much and then get going uh thereby reducing the, the entire uh, the big cctd is being shared across uh and just getting the data that you need because now you have the power to query the data as well uh the third is the thing that we were thinking is uh, you can increase the gap closure as well in fact uh, you know what what pairs can do is uh, they can enable the proactive gap closures uh, uh before the expiry basically there are certain ways and we'll be showing this a little in a little while how we can do it but what we are thinking is uh, pro- pairs can proactively match the providers uh, in order to uh, you know have the gap getting closed uh, there are certain measures we know uh, there are certain within certain dates or within certain amount of days uh, provider should take an action and if they are understand that uh, with this new rule uh, there are certain events that they will get 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 the notification of uh, or pretty much change country so admit this charge and the transfer they would get pretty much instantly get to know that this has happened now itself and they can probably try and nudge the provider in order to you know do what's required and proactively uh, you know ensure that the gap doesn't occur at all and the last one is uh, just the collaboration between uh, the fair uh, a slightly more collaboration between them uh, we can inspire process to share aggregate the member level compliance rates and so on and so forth uh, you know with uh, external stakeholders and also the uh, also the providers and we can actually provide them lot more extended analytics as well so these are all the four use cases we thought uh, uh, you know can be done uh, which is to drive the efficiency Uh, there could be few, there are few more and there could be a, you know a whole bunch of these use cases that we can think of but we thought that at, at least for the purpose of this one we'll focus on this four and we'll share this four and call it so part among these four uh, just can you share the poll results uh, now before yep. i move to the next slide yep i'll publish them yeah i am not so able to see it Yeah so I I can review that. Okay fine uh, so for so 40% yeah. Yeah there you go. Yeah so, so it says that uh, yeah 43% of you are saying that uh, yeah there are no uh, awareness across department about how to drive efficiency and 25% of you are saying that uh, yes the quality team understand the so the efficiency that fire can enable. And 23% are saying yes there are other departments also understand and probably 10% of uh, the answers are saying yes the organization already has performed business planning so this is good uh, you know there are 10% are, are really on the right track uh, and uh, if i look at it almost 35% are, are of the places where quality and other departments and there and the organization level there is something happening uh, that that's actually not a bad percentage looking at the previous uh, uh, poll answer uh, i'll go to the next slide and this is one of the illustrations that we are talking about about uh, you know fair engagement using and data collection using fire uh, this is how uh, usually the fair gap status can be sent across uh, the first one the way currently things happen is is written on the left hand side 
collection of supplemented HL7 and CCD medical charts and, and whatnot. And uh, you, know, you can probably keep sharing periodic gap list. And there is a turnaround of two to three weeks. I spoke about it, but I probably didn't speak about the turnaround time in my previous slide when I was talking about it. Yeah, but there is a uh, there is a big uh, you know turnaround time of uh, two to three weeks uh, for the provider to turn around the data request. In the future, said as you said that uh, you know pairs and the care coordinator the pair side when they look at uh, when they look at their medical uh, records review application and they look at a particular patient and they want to get the get the data. Uh, yes, within 24 hours uh, the request will be turned around. And it can actually probably become a real time as well if uh, if the pair is not asking for bulk data. If the pair is asking, the pair is going to query a specific uh, entity for the given member. Uh, then then the response time is not even going to be turned. 24 hours is probably going to be right now because I am making a get operation uh, for a smaller uh, smaller chunk of the of the data. Uh, what we are thinking uh, at, at the top, you will see uh, how how the gap status can be communicated between the two organizations, and uh, how the major and major reports can be shared. So, uh, providers uh, has uh, has a has a small handheld app, and they can just use it. Uh, look at the member compliance response. Uh, they will first do a search for the member, look at the compliance response, and see what happens. So, this is this is what we were thinking. Uh, rather, we we are implementing some of these things. Uh, for for some other uh, you know, places as well. Uh, the next one is uh, collaborative gap closure, and this is this goes back to uh, the place where I was talking about that uh, pairs can probably nudge the providers in order to have a, a proactive gap closure, or in order to have a, a scenario where the gap doesn't occur. And PRC, that is transfer of care, uh, that that is a measure that we thought uh, you know can be can be leveraged to. Uh, can be leveraged to tell you how it how it might work. So uh, the first thing what what would happen is uh, whenever uh, provider initiates uh, the pre auth request, the payer gets to know that yes, there is going to be. And let's take an example of an uh, you know elective surgery. Uh, so when provider initiates the pre auth, uh, payer gets to know that yes, an, uh, an elective surgery is planned, and uh, and then. What happens next is once when the discharge status is confirmed, the pro, the pro, the pair again comes to know right then and there that yes, uh, this particular uh, patient is now discharged, and they will they will get uh, remaining things like they want to know encounter details, the procedures and notes they can query. But what proactively the pair can notify is following: uh, upon uh, you know sharing the confirmation, they can say okay, can you? Uh, they can send a notification to the physician that yes, uh, check for a funding schedule. Uh, they can also send out yes, uh, the discharge set, the discharge confirmation I have received, but I probably haven't received the discharge documentation. They can they can ask the physician correct uh, to get all the information of uh, the next appointment scheduling that has to happen after within the 30 days of uh, of the discharge from the from the from the hospital. And they can match the PCP as well. That uh, this, this this patient is discharged. Uh, why don't you go and uh, schedule an appointment within the 30 days? So that is the way uh, we are thinking that uh, fair and providers uh, they can use this uh, fire uh, as a data exchange platform uh, to to better manage this, uh, the patient's health and also to uh, have a better control over their starts and CDS rating. Uh, that brings to the uh, the last last topic. Uh, what should be my fire implementation strategy, uh, and strategy? Uh, so this is where uh, we have thought at Phoenix that there are three different uh, buckets in which I can I can step into fire strategy, or I can take three different steps to you know, go up the ladder. The the first one we call it foundational, and which is more about the seamless regulatory compliance. Uh, that would involve uh, setting up the fire servers, uh, setting up fire parsing. Uh, but NetNet, what it says is uh, uh, enable your data, which is uh, which is uh, at your enterprise level. Uh, enable your data to be accessed by external guys. Enable your data to be accessed by payers. Enable your data to be accessed by members. And also implement uh, right authentication, authorization, and uh, consent management. Uh, 
from the way the CMS has said in order to be compliant with the with the rule. Uh, of course, uh, then the, you can have multiple uh, you know, member apps uh, for partner onboarding. You can have uh, multiple apps for your member onboarding as well. The last point is API management. It's more of a technical uh, part. It's not really commanded from from CMS. But yes, and since you would be exposing a lot of uh, Fire APIs to external world, uh, it's better to have a nice API management tool. But I'm not really promoting any API management tool here. All I'm saying is these are all the things uh, you know that you do in order to be CMS regulatory compliance in a in a in an elegant fashion. Uh, the second step of, on the ladder that uh, we have imagined is a scaled up uh, an integration. What we mean by that is uh, prioritize the operational use cases, uh, identify the gaps list, share it with with your provider, share it with uh, you know other stakeholders and enable uh, supplemental data collection as uh, was talked about some time back. Uh, Jeff also talked about it. Uh, that is something which will give upside from, from your stars and build uh, you know, uh, calculation perspective. Uh, the next thing that we thought is uh, what we can do is uh, we can integrate the uh, fire engine. So every player would be having a fire calculation engine or the Hades calculation engine in their, uh, in their enterprise. And what can happen is the fire gateway can be integrated with the Hades engine. So somebody can send you data that is patient data, which is probably a big bundle of all sorts of data uh, on your uh, fire gateway. And what you can respond is, okay, this is the score for that particular patient. Uh, but it is it is more about integrating uh, the engine that you have with the fire gateway that you are going to anyway set up. And probably the last thing that we are thinking is uh, you know, talk to your provider partners to validate certain workflows uh, and also DSP3 because this is the one where uh, DSP4 is uh, being mandated. Uh, but uh, currently, uh, not really all the pro providers are mandated from DSP4. Uh, they, will, they will come up there, but uh, players will have to be uh, DSP4 compliant by 1st of January or more. So for the issue three, maybe you can talk to some of the provider partners and see the same workflows work for you or not. The last one is transformation, uh, which is the comprehensive rollout of uh, the entire capabilities that we talked about. And uh, that's the first thing. And, and what we can do is things like uh, you know, identify and implement major specific uh, innovation uh, strategies, uh, exactly the one which we talked about in PRC gap closure. But uh, you can you can actually uh, go ahead and create some more strategies as well. Uh, just not just uh, sitting here at the TRC, but there are other measures also you can look at. Uh, one another one that I can think of is uh, low back pain. Uh, low back pain is the one where you know after the first visit with the back pain, within 28 days, uh, imaging uh, imaging studies need to happen. So once when I know that the uh, patient has visited, I, I get a discharge notification. Yes, the patient visited. I get to know why it was visited. I see it was the low back pain. I can nudge the patient provider in such a fashion uh, to drive him to get uh, imaging study done in 28 days. Uh, exactly the way we talked about TRC, uh, something can be done for LVP as well. Uh, there can be few more, uh, rather a lot more such scenarios that we can think of. And uh, when we are saying transformation, we are actually talking about uh, unleashing the entire power of uh, data action and not just uh, wait for getting data, not just to, you know, uh, in, ensure that our get data is reached at uh, at an instance when it is generated, but also uh, you know, do something which is a lot more proactive in order to close the gap or in order to not to have the gap itself. And the last one that we can think of is uh, include fire based data sharing as your you know value based uh, contract components. So these are all the things that these are the three uh, steps that we thought uh, could be. The way uh, one can progress from foundational to progressive to transformation. Uh, these are all uh, again exactly the way uh, statistic thinks. Uh, your uh, your thinking could be slightly different, but again, uh, foundational probably wouldn't change. The way you want to tra scale out here and think of your uh, progress and transformation is something uh, we definitely feel you know you can think better. But yeah, these are all the guides uh, guidance that we can think of and we can give. But that brings me to the next slide, and this is the next poll question, and this is the last one. Uh, which area would you like uh, you know, more details around uh, through a subsequent webinar if you really would like us to create one? 
uh, and the first one is fire enable data exchange use cases. Uh, the use cases that we talked about, we just touched upon those, but we would really like to have more details around that. So the next one is fire enable proactive gap process. And the next one is the detail approach around the regulatory compliance. Uh, that is CMS and NCQA, uh, not from the CMS IP rule, but from an NCQA and HADIS perspective. And the next one, detailed implementation approach about uh, you know HADIS and star use cases. So these are all the things that uh, we wanted to ask you. Uh, if you can uh, let us know about it, we can probably come up with a new and uh, a webinar which can be targeted around those things only. This actually brings me to, uh, to the last slide of the webinar, and that's, that's the end of it. And we probably have 13 odd minutes left to take up any questions if there are any. And this is, a, anyway, just a serious corporate overview. I'm not going to go through this uh, slide at all. I'm just going to leave this slide here for you all to read through it. Uh, Jeff, do you want to take up for, for the questions? Yeah, why don't, why don't we look at the poll results uh, first from our last question? Yeah, okay, that's correct. I, I forgot about polls. I I reached the last slide and <laughs> I'm more not able to scroll down. Okay, I'm able to. Okay, so twenty six percent of the you know our participants are saying parameter data exchange use cases. Uh ten percent are saying proactive gap closure, twenty three percent are saying detailed approach for regulatory compliance, and yes, a whopping forty two percent are saying that Detailed explanation of approach specific to Hedis and star use cases. So, Jeff, you know what you have to work on next uh, with your team uh, in the in the CQM cal calculation mm -hmm. part. Uh, detailed ex implementation approach for Hedis and star. Uh, you have your uh, you know, next uh, you know, next thing cut out. Jeff. Yep. Okay. So, so sorry, would you like to take the question? Yeah. So let's. Uh, Let's go through some of the questions we got. We've gotten actually a fair uh, uh, number of questions. So um, here's a question for you, Swarn. You say uh, everyone is using Fire in the same way, but it seems to me like it's all extensions and customizations and not really a single standard, standard that everyone use, uses. Can you address this? Absolutely. And uh, I, I I know that even Fire supports Fire user extensions because uh, people uh, people like it because uh, a, a, any uh, any standard may not really cover everything, anything and everything under the stack. Uh, the only reason we we are saying that Fire will be a lot more uh, standard than earlier one. Uh, it goes back to the fact that Jay was talking about. Uh, while coming up with the standard system, it's not something that regulatory body has dictated a standard that this is what you need to start. Uh, so using from tomorrow, this is the way you are going to start uh, exchanging data from tomorrow or so. Uh, but while making standard itself, uh, it's not just a regulatory body, but also a lot of uh, health IT companies are part of it. Uh, you looked at uh, this, uh, then uh, you know, industry consortiums like Da Vinci and Karen Alley. Again, those are uh, driven by and those have been uh, you know, monitored by uh, some of the private partners who are actually going to use um, use this uh, uh, fire as a data exchange format in in future, and that's the reason why we feel uh, this is going to be uh, the different one than others. But yes, uh, the, the question that you're asking, Janice, is absolutely correct. Uh, fire also gives you a way to you know, add more extension of your own. But just uh, we we feel that the base fire uh, is something which is contributed back uh, by health IT companies as well. Uh, like having uh, pretty much a similar looking fire report being shared at all. Yeah. Yep. Yes. And here's here's a, another question that comes uh, actually in two parts. So let me read both of the parts because I think they're relevant. So um, if we use a vendor product to do our HEDIS submission based on their standards, would that change to fire standards? So that was the first part of the question. But the second part is a follow up question. Uh, should we continue to go through that vendor solution, or does Fire have an open source uh, engine to get the measures? So, this one, I would break this down between measures and data, and talk about uh, both. And I can take the measures portion if you want to take uh, the data portion um, uh, for this answer. So, clearly, 
um, you'll have to talk to your own vendors. And this is coming from a question. This question is coming from somebody who's not our HEDIS customer. So you'll have to talk to your own vendor around that. Uh, what NCQA is doing right now is uh, proof of concepts around uh, fire measures, and they're talking about launching them in 2022. Um, so they haven't come out with those measures yet. We are intending with our product to include them in uh, in our product, but the data exchange is different. So the data exchange uh, and the inclusion of the measures as uh, supplemental data um, does not necessarily have to go through your uh, HEDIS vendor. And Swan, if you want to talk a little bit to that, I think that that would be good for the audience to uh, understand the difference there. Yes, I think you covered, <laughs> uh, I think you covered all, all the points in answer. But yeah, uh, the okay. business uh, specific thing that is, is there a vendor? Is, or does Fire have open source engine that can get the measures? Uh, uh, not really. Uh, it it would be through through the vendor solution itself. Uh, Fire doesn't really have it, uh, uh, and and uh, an engine that can you know give you the uh, major calculations or so. But otherwise, yes, you you cover everything. There was a, another question that came in uh, based on the quote. We said that 95% of HEDIS data can be collected via FIRE. Can you give a brief overview of how you arrived at that number and what constitutes the remaining 5% and why that wouldn't work with FIRE? And so what we've done is we've taken uh, for all of the hybrid measures, the data that has to be collected via the um, medical record review process and map those to the existing interfaces. And 95% of the elements there uh, could be mapped directly. Um, and so we're happy to give you more information on that um, uh, to go through that mapping. You saw how we mapped uh, uh, one uh, measure. Clearly the mapping goes down multiple levels and details to the specific elements. Um, but what we've done is gone through uh, the standards that are out there from FHIR as well as the elements from the HEDIS hybrid measures uh, to map them. And for 95% of those elements, there's clean mapping uh, that can be done. Um, it's the analysis that we've done uh, around this. Um, so I think we have time probably for one or two more questions here, Swarren. Uh, let me just read through and see if we can find one. Which one it is? Um, here, here, here's one for you. Can you confirm that providers are required to comply with the CMS patient access API rule? I had previously understood this only applied to payers. It's actually applied to uh, to payers. Uh, the CMS rule is. Uh, providers uh, have a slightly different uh, way to do it. Uh, that that's basically ONC rule. And what they need to do. This is following three things. So as per the rules, there are five things that the payer need to comply to. Uh, one of them is the infrastructure network, which is deferred, so they are not really worrying about it. And the second, and what uh, providers need to worry about is, uh, you know, they need to be doing public reporting and they need to acting against information blocking. That's the first thing. The second thing that they need to do is detailed contact information. That is their uh, description. And the third one is the uh, LDT event notification to be sent across to all the relevant stakeholders. Uh, all the relevant stakeholders, which would also mean PCP and payer and whatnot. Uh, and while they are doing this, uh, sending this notification, that is uh, admit to share transfer, uh, they are not really mandated as of now uh, to use FHIR as a standard. Uh, they can use any standard, which is SSN v 25 Yes, we can go to the next question. Yeah, let's just take one last question here. Um, so uh, ONC and regulatory bodies seem to keep moving the direction on standards and technologies. Do you feel this will, uh, do you feel this will support solutions or continue to change the industry? Ms. Warren, do you want to take a first cut at that and then I can add as well or? Yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm just reading the question one second. So the ONC regulatory bodies seem to keep moving the direction on standards and technologies. Do you see this will support solutions or continue challenging this? Ah, yes, you want to go. Ahead. Sure. Uh, yeah. So we've uh, 
<laughs> yeah. Go We've ahead. had um, multiple conversations uh, with some NCQA folks about what they're trying to do from a standards perspective and what does this mean uh, for where they're trying to move folks. So um, I think that the regulatory bodies are trying to make this simpler. They recognize that quality is difficult and expensive and the manual efforts that are involved uh, are are costly, but that quality really drives improvement and that value-based um, is the way to go to help to drive improvement. So what we've seen is uh, programs coming together. Um, so we talked today about payer and provider programs, but we're also seeing uh, merging of concepts uh, in, you know, the uh, STARS regulations with convergence of pop health and uh, value-based and HEDIS uh, STARS in terms of how the thinking goes there. Um, so our impression, this is our impression, um, is that they're really trying to make this easier, but to move towards a value-based world and a world where there's less and less manual intervention that's required around this. So the exchange of data, the combination of programs. So most of the payers that we deal with have, you know, two, three, five groups that deal with quality, whether it's a care management group a pop health group, a value-based care group, a HEDIS group, a STARS group, and the combination of those and the exchange of data to support all of those really, I think, is the vision that they have. And where I agree, if we can bring that together, it makes the world easier for everybody's payers, providers, and the members, patients themselves as well. That's my impression um, uh, of where they're going. And yeah, I mean, if you ask me, I'm, I'm saying that's that's actually good for us, uh, at least for a health IT company. Just to make the mood lighter here, yeah, it is really good for a health IT company. They have to keep on changing <laughs> few things, and they have to keep on making more money. <laughs> and with that, we'll wrap up. We'll we'll uh, say everybody stay safe, um, uh, and um, look forward to hearing how your heated seasons went. Take care. Thank you, and thank you so much. Thank you to our speakers. That was a great presentation, and thank you for sharing your thoughts. And thank you, the audience, for participating in today's webinar. This concludes today's presentation. Thank you again, and enjoy the rest of your day.